session with uh, Finance Minister Jim Flaherty. Jim, welcome to Edmonton. Thank you so much for coming out here for Good this to event. Be here. Thanks for uh, hosting this, James, and thanks to the and thanks for chairing the Finance Committee, which is the most important chair that we have in the parliamentary system. And um, I thank the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, and um, I want to speak to Angus Watt about what their salary scale is. <laughs> Well, I wanted to start, before we get into the meat of the update itself, I wanted to start perhaps with the process, and I chair the Finance Committee. We do pre-budget consultations in the summer. In the fall, we table our report in Parliament in December. It's a, from a committee. It's an all-party committee. And, but if, I want, if you could sort of walk people through the budgetary process from there in terms of the input that you receive as minister and as a department over the successive year. Well, we, we consult uh, starting in the fall every year with a view to uh, producing the budget in uh, early in the new year. We try to do the budget within the fiscal year, and the fiscal year ends at the end of March, the federal government fiscal year. So we try to do it before then so d departments can plan ahead on, on what they're doing. Uh, James's committee uh, travels and does uh, consultations across the country. I do some of that, but not nearly what his committee does. And his committee, of course, has members on it that are from all political parties that are represented in the House of Commons. And, uh, and I must say that James does a very good job of keeping the peace in the land with, uh, with the people on that committee and, and uh, coordinating the recommendations, many of which uh, we have adopted. We also do consultations with, um, with business, of course, with the boards of trade, with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, um, all of these, and my staff meets with lots of people too, and I meet with whomever I can. And um, Minister Sorensen, who's the Minister of State Finance, um, also does a series of meetings. So we get a lot of input, is what I'm <coughs> trying to say. And then we make choices. And the usual choice is no. Um, <laughs> In fact, I have a rubber stamp, but I forgot to bring it. My staff gave it to me a few Christmases ago. One of those old-fashioned rubber stamps, and all it says is no. And I find it very handy. <laughs> because everybody wants something, right, as James knows in his committee. And, and it's up to governments to have the fortitude to say, no, here are our priorities. We're going to balance the budget. We want investor confidence. We want people around the world to look at our country and the Canadian brand as being a strong brand, a responsible, reliable brand, and I think we're not doing too bad at that. Now we'll just get into the meat of the economic update itself, and I know you meet regularly with the private sector economists, as you referenced in the video, but if you can walk us through the updated projections that we have in this economic and fiscal update. Yeah, I'll, I'll use some of the numbers. I'll try not to bore you with numbers too much, but if you think about what happened in the world, and, and we were elected in 2006, the first couple of years, the Prime Minister and I talked about this, we said, well, what can we do? Where's the danger in the world? The danger, in our view, was the level of U.S. Uh, deficits and accumulating public debt. That's still a problem. But um, the credit, so the first two years, we paid down public debt, we ran surpluses, we paid down about $38 billion in public debt. Then late 2007, the credit crisis, subprime mortgages in the United States, lots of problems with respect to the availability for credit for business, so we took some steps there. And then the, the Great Recession, as it's called now, in 2008. Um, and so we had to make a very important choice. Um, do we leave our plan of running surpluses? and run big deficits or not. And we decided to run a, a big deficit, $58 billion, to do the earliest budget in Canadian history on January 27, 2009. So that was the, the start. But the plan always was to get back to balanced budgets. Why did we run the big deficit? Because we were concerned that we would have millions and millions of Canadians out of work, and that we'd, we would have a long, dark, deep, recession. And nobody knew back then how long, it was. as it was, what we did worked, the spending worked, we got the money out the door quickly on infrastructure and other things, and we never had double-digit unemployment in Canada, unlike 
our, um, our American neighbors. So then we said, well, we've got to get back to balance. So we had a plan every year to reduce, reduce, reduce. And we've reduced it by about two-thirds now. And next year, even more. And then we'll be able to balance um, the following year. Once we balance, then governments has, has options again. Obviously, my preference is to pay down public debt, because I don't believe in public debt. And um, I, I think uh, we've got it down to a point now where the interest payments are 11 cents of every tax dollar. There was a time in Canada not that long ago, um, in the early 90s, where it was almost 30 cents of every tax dollar that you pay and I pay, I hope James pays, um, went for interest on the public debt. What a waste, you know, when we need money for infrastructure and we need money for, for schools and hospitals and transfers to the provinces and all that. And we did all this, by the way, in the last four or five years without reducing transfers to the provinces. We're at 6% a year, we've continued that. We didn't do what the previous government did, and that is we whack the provinces on health care and education transfers. And I know that because I was Minister of Finance in a provincial government, and it was a very difficult time when the federal government of the day chose to whack the provinces as a way to improve their fiscal situation. So the overall plan going towards balancing the budget in 2015 was actually established in 2009 with the two years of very large spending on programs like infrastructure, which I think we'll return to. But it was also about restraining the areas of government department, about $70 billion, while maintaining transfers to provinces for health care, education, social assistance, and transfers to persons for family and right. elderly benefits. Yeah, and we, we control our own direct spending. As I think the video said, we've reduced the federal government's direct program spending for three years in a row. That has never happened in Canadian history before. You can do it. It's like running a... Many of you are in business. You can do it if you have the resilience to follow through and take some of the flack um, that, that comes with that. But things happen, um, like the flooding in Alberta this year. And the federal contribution will be uh, $2.8 billion, according to the statute. And that's not budgeted. We don't budget you know, for massive un unexpected flooding. The lac Megantic uh, tra railway disaster also is uh, expensive, and we have to put that in this year's budget. So the deficit will be a little bit higher than I wanted it to be this year. It'll still be lower than last year, um, but these are parts of being uh, a federation and uh, taking care of each other. Can you speak a little bit to the updated growth number projections as well as on the revenue and expenditure side in terms of how the numbers have changed somewhat since the March budget? Yeah, I meet with the private sector economists, and when we budget, we use um, the average of the private sector economists' projections with respect to real GDP. So it isn't a made-up number at finance, and I don't make it up. I live with what they give me. Um, it's a little more modest on nominal GDP, but we have, we have modest growth. In many parts of the world, they'd be happy to have the growth we have in Canada. Moderate growth, 1.8%, 2%. We'll see... Um, by the end of the year, but it is growth. Our employment numbers are very good, actually. There's more than a million net new jobs in Canada since the end of the recession in July 2009. So we're doing relatively well in Canada. I know when I go to these international meetings, well, one Secretary of the Treasury referred to Canada as virtuous Canada. <laughs> I'm not sure it was a compliment. <laughs> Can we talk about virtu virtuous, James? <laughs> virtuous, James. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> if we could talk, we had a, a brief session with, uh, with obviously the chair and some of the, the board members of the chamber, and, and you heard the refrain that I hear all the time for businesses in Alberta, which is the challenge of labor, of finding enough people of all types of skills to fill all types of positions in all types of companies, large, small, medium-sized. So labor, economic growth is a key issue here in terms of can we access enough people uh, so that we can grow as much as we can in this province and certainly across the Prairie Provinces and even in areas, the last time our committee was in St. John's, Newfoundland, that was the common refrain is the challenge of accessing enough people with the right skills. Right. We do have fairly good labor mobility in Canada. It could be more. I, um, 
I met in Regina last week with Premier Wald, and he was saying how strange it felt to him to fly from Saskatchewan to Ireland to a job fair when he knew he was flying over areas of Canada with double-digit unemployment rates. And why couldn't we get Canadians to take up these, these jobs? What we're doing now, we announced in the last budget, is a direct job grants program by the Government of Canada involving employers and community colleges and unions, the building trades and so on, because we give the provinces a lot of billions and billions of dollars every year, and quite frankly, we don't know what jobs are, are um, obtained as a result of that investment. We know a number of people get trained, and they'll give us the provinces, will tell us so many thousand people were trained at X and Y, but we don't know whether they're working. So we want to relate the, the funding of these, this program, the job grants program, with your tax money directly to the job market, which necessarily engages um, employers. And uh, that, that, I think, will be an important step. It's being negotiated now and worked out and uh, should be in place next year. Some of the other measures since 2006, obviously a lot of the initiatives on the apprenticeship side, but in the last number of years, many small businesses have come to us and said there's a real crunch in terms of uh, what they pay on the EI premium side. So I, perhaps you could talk about uh, the freezing of the EI premiums as well as uh, the hiring credit for small business, which I think has been utilized by over 500,000 small businesses across Canada. Right. On the second part, we continued that, as you know, James. We continued the hiring credit for small business because it works and it gets people um, hired. Getting your foot in the door really matters, especially for young people. Logan and I were talking about it today. I'm sure he's going to be successful. He's a great cross-examiner at grade, the grade nine level. Um, yeah, it's, it's important. That's why internships, we're sponsoring internships also federally and apprenticeships, just to give people an opportunity to show what they can do. And then let, it, let the employers obviously will decide about, about their, um, their capabilities. And the, and the training is very important too, but I've already talked about that in terms of the, of the job grants um, program. Now in terms of tax policy, which is something raised by many uh, people in this room and across the country in terms of taxes on small, large businesses, on individuals, on families, uh, you, in the video mentioned the lower tax burden since 2006 on the average Canadian family. But do you want to speak about the approach towards business taxation, especially during the period of balancing the budget? Yeah, first, I didn't answer your question about EI. We froze EI premiums for the next two years. We announced that a little while ago. Um, that's important because, as you know, EI is a contributory plan by employees and employers. So it's, it's, it's basically a payroll tax. And um, lots of people seem to like payroll taxes. I don't. We know that they, uh, they are direct job killers. And that's been demonstrated over many, over many um, years. So on the corporate tax side, we decided in 2007 that we would reduce the federal corporate tax rate to 15%. When we took office in 2006, it was a little bit over 22%. Um, percent. And uh, we asked the provinces to join us to get their corporate tax rates down to uh, 10%. Doesn't apply to Alberta. They were already there. Um, and most of the provinces, including Ontario, have gone in that direction. British Columbia certainly has. Ontario recently bumped up a percentage point to 11. Again, it's the Canadian brand. It's being able to say on, at meetings and on airplanes and in your elevator conversations in Houston or New York or wherever you are, you know our corporate tax rate generally in Canada is 25%. Americans are just amazed at that and the opportunity to invest in, the, in this country and get a good return without paying a lot of, um, of tax. So that's been a, uh, another Advantage Canada item that gives us an advantage over other, certainly over other G7 uh, countries. And on the, on the market access issues, I want to perhaps pose uh, two types of questions. One is relating, and we did have the question in the earlier session about the Canada-European trade agreement, the impact that will have in terms of jobs and growth in this country, the access to the size of that market. And then also I wanted to ask a question with respect to commodity uh, prices because I know that would, that's a big topic obviously in this province with respect to pipeline capacity, 
getting our products to market, getting a fair market price. So if you want to address those two issues. Sure. The second one first, and I've already heard about it at lunch and this morning, um, the oil discount. I mean, this is a problem, as you all know, in getting uh, the product to market. And we have three options on the table right now. Well, we have the one that's being used now, rail, um, which is uh, the numbers are just staggering. Um, but so that's not a long-term solution. And, and the safest way of moving, of moving oil is through pipelines. So uh, we have the option to the West Coast. That faces some obstacles. I know the government of Alberta and the government of British Columbia are working together, which is great, and we're supportive. And we can help, the government of Canada can, in terms of working with the uh, First Nations because of the uh, constitutional responsibility of the federal government with respect to Aboriginal people. And then there's the option to Churchill, Manitoba, which I would not discount. And then there's the option to St. John, New Brunswick, much of which is in place. Um, I think we should do them all, personally. Um, this is the future of the country. It's long term. I think we should move on all fronts. The quickest one, might, shockingly, because it's so far away, it might be to St. John, New Brunswick. Um, it's a deep water port. It does not freeze up. Canada's largest refinery is there, so the product can be refined in our own country, which is um, kind of nice. Um, but whatever, whatever comes first, we need to do something because of this discount. I was in Texas the other week, and I can tell you the support for the um, Keystone Pipeline is huge. The polling in the United States is uh, two-thirds, one-third in favor in, of, of, of building the Keystone Pipeline. The Building Trades uh, Union had a uh, press conference with the United States Chamber of Commerce in Washington. Rare that they would be together, but they agreed that this was very important for the future of, um, of the United States and the jobs that would be created. So I'm hopeful that um, the sensible course will be followed. Okay. Now, I wanted to, and I think, I think it's, the mayor would uh, very much want me to ask this question in terms of infrastructure. So if we can return to infrastructure spending, um, you did finalize the agreement in terms of the Building Canada Fund expiring in 2014. So we have that fund moving forward after that. And also the P3 Canada Fund, which in Edmonton through the uh, southeastern LRT link is in fact utilizing. So I wanted to get you to address the infrastructure plan going forward, which is obviously a big issue for municipalities across the country. Well, one of the former councillors in this room was the uh, head of uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, with whom I negotiated about the new infrastructure plan. I can tell you she was very difficult <laughs> um, and, and persistent. And she, for the most part, won. Um, we. Uh, we have a new plan starting next year. We're still using the money from before. It's $70 billion over, over eight years. And infrastructure funding tends to be it's very uh, back-end loaded, if I can put it that way. It's the shape of a hockey stick. Because at the beginning, you're doing environmental assessments and planning and engineering studies. And then you start building something, and the costs escalate, of, of course. So we're budgeting that. We have budgeted that. And the money will be there because we have a sustainable plan for the economy. So people don't have to worry that governments make promises and then either can't pay for them or they go borrow the money and drive up interest rates um, in doing that. I'm a big fan of uh, public-private partnerships. I did them when I was finance minister of Ontario. I created uh, P3 Canada Inc., Public-Private Partnerships Canada Inc., which is a separate crown agency which has its own budget, its own board, reports to Parliament through me as Minister of, of Finance. And they're doing more and more work. I notice from what I see on my desk, more and more work in Western Canada, which makes sense because of the amount of economic growth and, and the demand for infrastructure here. And I'm glad that cities like Edmonton and Calgary and others have engaged in the P3 process. Because you know, why do it? Because it... It means that projects uh, are on time and on budget because the private sector has a role and is worried about losing their profit edge. And um, they tend to be very successful, and not just for highways. They're used a lot for highways and transit and sewage and water plants. We're doing some of that in, on the 
uh, Vancouver Island, um, but, but also for hospitals, schools, all kinds of things. And there are examples across Canada. The, um, the Royal Ottawa Hospital is a P3 that we did 10 years ago. Incredibly successful. The unions love it, the nurses love it, the physicians love it, the patients love it. And um, it's just a good, it's a very effective way of getting more infrastructure for the same money. And if I can return then to the issue of investment, if you look at the overall budgetary plan, as you said, you're continuing to increase transfers to provinces for things like health care, transfers to persons. At the same time, you're restraining spending on that $70 billion of direct federal spending. But the important message as well here today is, as a government, we're continuing to invest, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's research and development, whether it's other higher priority areas. And perhaps in a city with a lot of post-secondary, a lot of influence of post-secondary institutions, uh, leading in national institutions here. I wonder if you wanted to address investments in areas like research and development. Yeah, we have, uh, throughout the, the recession, intentionally not reduced federal government spending through the three granting councils and our direct spending on postdoctoral fellowships and other um, research initiatives in the universities across the country. Um, why? Because it's important for the future growth of, of the country. So we give it priority. Um, it's longer term, of course, but a, but a country that cares about its future and has some vision of its future, it seems to me, has to make sure that we're smart. And um, you know, more than a half the jobs in this country today are created by young, innovative people. I was at Ryerson University recently at their, in Toronto at their digital media center. The president of Ryerson was very kindly introduced me to some of the students and they explained their projects to me. There were seven or eight of them different projects and one had 10 employees and one had 20. These are all very young people who are very smart. And um, I didn't understand anything they told me. <laughs> I didn't tell them that. I went, oh yes, and, uh, of course. <laughs> you know, we all know that. Um, but it's, it is just wonderfully amazing. Um, what is being accomplished by young, um, smart people on our university and college campuses um, in Canada. So we can't back off that uh, funding, even though some of the provinces have reduced funding for universities and um, colleges, which I think is, uh, for the reasons I've already expressed, unwise. And, and uh, Jim, one of the things that's commonly said about Canada is we, we are creating, generating ideas, we have excellent researchers, we have excellent institutions, we sometimes have challenges in terms of commercializing those ideas here in Canada. Now, you've established a venture capital fund. You've looked at uh, innovative ways to incubate and grow businesses here in Canada. We obviously have Tech Edmonton. We have Startup Edmonton here in Edmonton. I wanted, if, if you wanted to address the venture capital aspect in terms of these innovators accessing uh, financing. Yeah, well, you're right, of course. 